Apostles' Creed has been recited at some point. Uh, so if you if you remember it, or even remember lines of it, say them as I, as I as I uh, read it. I remember, but I, I I wrote it down just in case. You never know what this mind's going to do. So I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, or to hell, depending on which way you remember it. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Apostles' Creed, or at least part of the Apostles' Creed, was crafted with 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 19 in mind. Oftentimes people say, wait, he descended into hell. Where in the Bible does it say that? I don't recall that anywhere in the Bible. Well, it doesn't say he descended into hell. That, theologically speaking, is a silly thing, since hell was created for after the Last Judgment, and clearly that hasn't happened yet. So what, what, it, what gets translated into hell is the Greek word Hades, and Hades is not quite hell. It's really just the place where all the dead go to. Now, granted, Hades is compartmentalized, and you have like the part of Hades where the good souls go, and the part of Hades where the not-so-good souls go. But... Haiti, and you've got the, of course, in Greek culture, you've got the part of uh, 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 Hades where the heroic people go. So, you know, it's compartmentalized. Basically, it's a holding place for all of the dead. And the closest thing in Jewish, um, in Jewish language and in Jewish culture and Jewish beliefs to Hades is something called Sheol, which is less uh, structured than, and compartmentalized than, say, uh, Hades, but it's a similar holding place for all of the dead. That when you died, you were literally buried in the ground, and you were put into, you were in Sheol, which is where every soul from all, from since the beginning of time, did. So, so the Jewish belief, um, at its primary core, at its earliest, didn't believe necessarily in an afterlife. They didn't have an understanding initially of a heaven or of a hell. But the, this understanding that we, we were created, from dust we came, to dust we return, and that, um, that really what mattered was life in between, those two points. And um, Sheol wasn't a bad place, but it wasn't a good place. It wasn't a place you longed to go to. And you hear the psalmist say, out of the depths of Sheol you have, free, you have freed me. Um, this understanding of being freed from the bonds of death. But it was a final place that you would go to. Now, as time went, as persecutions happened, as people, you know, looked to God for answers, they started to think, well, maybe there's something more than just Sheol. Maybe, maybe God is saving people in Sheol until the final judgment, when the good and the bad will be, will be, uh, you know, well, the good will be vindicated and the bad will be punished according to what they've done. And so you start to get this development of, of, of a heaven and, of, and of, a, of a hell. Not quite the way it develops into Christianity, but, but similar. Um, so, all of that to say, all that historical, cultural, religious background to say, that when Peter says uh, that Jesus died a physical death, but was raised to life in the spirit, and then he went to Hades, or as it was translated into, into the text that was read tonight, he went to the place of the dead and preached to the spirits of time gone by, what that author is trying to say is, look, it, it's great that Jesus came to life, and he lived, and he was the Son of God, and he died, and he resurrected, and anyone who believes in Jesus is saved. What about Moses? He didn't believe in Jesus. What about Elijah? He didn't believe in Jesus. What about everybody who came, good and bad, who came before Jesus? How could they believe in Jesus and be saved? And so... This author says, well, it's simple. When Jesus died, he too entered into Sheol, because that's where you go when you die. And in Sheol, they came to know Jesus. And then Jesus resurrected. And now, 
that takes care of all the people in the past and takes care of all the people in the present and certainly covers all the people in the future if they choose to believe in Jesus Christ. So it's a theological working of how people before Jesus came to be saved. And it's a pretty interesting and specifically Jewish working of it because it's taking into account uh, the fact that there's this belief that the dead, when they die, stay dead, except through Jesus Christ. And one day, Jesus would, would everybody would share in Jesus' resurrection, and those who believed in Jesus would be vindicated and, and, would, be, and would be saved from all of, all of the things that they'd done wrong, and they, their slate would be wiped clean, and they would spend eternal life with Jesus. And, and for those who didn't, well, you know, we'll save that for Revelation, right? <laughs> what happens at the end of time? Traditionally speaking, this text has been the backbone of Christian salvation theology. That Jesus died on the cross, a sacrifice for sinners. That his sacrifice was an atonement for our sins. And that he substituted himself in place of us and took the penalty of our sins upon his own shoulders. And that because he died, we don't have to die. Now, we could split hairs and say, but we do die, you know? Like, but, you know, the author's talking about spiritually, we don't have to die. This theology has comforted millions of people, myself included at various points in my life, who feel burdened by their sins and, and are thankful for the grace of God in and through Jesus Christ's sacrifice. However, I also recognize that it has caused people to question a God that would sacrifice, that would sacrifice a person who had never sinned in order to save those who have sinned. What kind of God takes an innocent person and sacrifices that innocent person on behalf of people who don't want salvation to begin with, the people who are wicked and don't care and are messing up and, and don't deserve salvation? You're taking the righteous person and you're nailing him to a cross, humiliating him, killing him, for what? Isn't there a can't we save sinners a better way? Like, is, it, is that the only way we can save sinners? Is by nailing somebody who did nothing wrong to a cross so that he can pay for the sins that God could easily just go like that and erase? Why? So people question this. And rightfully so. I think believing something blindly is not a good thing. I think having faith means questioning, means wrestling. Jacob, after all, was renamed Israel because he wrestled with God and with people, and prevailed. Our faith is about wrestling. People want to know, why would a just, a just and good God sacrifice the innocent for the guilty? A lot of people are going to watch um, uh, American Sniper, which is in the, in the movie theater. And whether that's your, your uh, cup of tea or not is beyond the point. But... Just imagine somebody like Chris Kyle, who by many people, by all accounts, by many people, is a hero who, who defended his country, who gave up his life, uh, or risked his life to defend his country, who came home and, and then was shot by some guy, right? Uh, who he was trying to help, ironically, right? He served four tours of, of, of duty, uh, had a bounty on his head over there by, by the people that, that, uh, that he was fighting against. Uh, survived all of that just to come home and be shot by some guy who was one of his own, who was, he was trying to help. Now imagine that as a just person, as a judge, I decide that, well, in order to, to help that person who uh, killed Chris Kyle, we're going to put Joey over here who did nothing wrong in jail to pay for his sins. How is that just? That's, that's kind of, like, I don't know about you, but that kind of goes against my idea of what justice is. Justice is that person paying for their sins because they did it, not Joey. And I, I don't know why I'm using Joey's name, but we'll throw Joey in under the bus for the time being. It's not fair that Joey has to pay for the sins of somebody else. Doesn't that apply to Jesus as well? So it, it makes sense to me that people question this theology. It must be said 
that we've read much more into tonight's text than is actually there. And that's important for us to realize. The word sacrifice is there. The concept of atonement, being made at one, you know, at one minute, the word play, being made one with God, right with God, that is there in this text. And certainly Jesus' innocence is there in this text. However, nowhere, nowhere at all does the author write that Jesus was a substitute for our sins. That God's only way of saving us was to punish Jesus. That is something that has developed piecing different scriptures together, including the practice of sacrifice in, in ancient Israel, all that together, that is, that is something that has developed at, into Christian theology, but is, is a bit of interpretation, as well as passages in scripture. Rather, uh, Jesus, who was sinless, sacrificed, this is what the scripture says, that Jesus sacrificed himself so that we might be brought safely home to God. Now there's a far cry from someone being sacrificed for somebody else, so that they don't have to be sacrificed, right? And somebody sacrificing himself for others. And using the Chris Kyle analogy, Chris Kyle certainly sacrificed himself for the people he was trying to help. He could have done his four tours of duty, gone home, lived the rest of his life out with his wife, focused on his own problems, and not reached out to help other people. But he sacrificed himself, and it cost him his life. That's a far cry from somebody sacrificing Chris Kyle so that somebody else doesn't have to suffer. And that's what we have here in this text. That Jesus, who was sinless, who did nothing wrong, who didn't deserve to die the death of a criminal on the cross, sacrificed himself so that we might be brought safely home to God. Perhaps we can understand this text in a new and powerful way, one that's true to the scripture, true to our Christian theology, true to the understanding of the cross and what Jesus did on the cross, but new and powerful and fresh. Perhaps we can understand it this way. Perhaps Jesus put his life on the line in order to show us the way to God. Though Jesus never sinned, it, it was sin that put Jesus on that cross, was it not? The sin of humanity, that rather than doing what is right, we choose to do what was wrong. When someone points out we're wrong, we don't look at ourselves as wrong, but we lash out at others. And we especially lash out the one who's pointing out that we're wrong, right? Like, they're the first to go. That Jesus accepted that. And rather than turning and running and keeping silent and not doing the things that God was calling him to do, he chose to sacrifice himself in order to show us the way home to God. What's more, that way to God comes through Jesus' sacrifice. As Jesus sacrificed himself for us, he calls us to sacrifice ourselves for others. But Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. Jesus suffered once for all time. He suffered in his life as a peasant laborer. He suffered in his ministry. He suffered under Roman oppression. He suffered in his crucifixion. But then God did something great. Because you know God. We can throw our monkey wrenches into the plan, but the plan keeps going, right? God works around us. God works in spite of us. And God did something great. He conquered death in and through Jesus Christ. And that resurrection rocked the world. It changed everything for everyone in all of history, And that change is still continuing to this day as we speak, and we are a part of it. One act of loving sacrifice brought the transformative grace of God into all of the world in a way that it had never been present before, in a way that, that it can never be paralleled. God did something truly amazing 
in and through Jesus Christ because Jesus chose that way. And Jesus is calling us to choose that way. It has inspired countless people to following Jesus, this great act of God's. It has inspired countless people to live in the way Jesus lived. It has inspired countless people to serve others and to be agents of hope and of healing and of wholeness. So tonight, let us remember Jesus' sacrifice, that Jesus suffered once, but for all of us, for all time. And Jesus calls us to be a part of that, to live into it, to follow his example, to sacrifice ourselves, maybe not on the cross, though certainly some people over in Iraq are finding that to be their reality. Jesus is calling us to pick up our cross, to sacrifice ourselves so that others may find the life that we've been given. So that others may find resurrection in death. So that others may find life through that resurrection. Let us be among the countless, inspired to be living sacrifices, walking in the footsteps of the Christ who gave his very life for us. Amen.